Good morning, Indiana. My name is Don Teeter. I am a family doctor who now specializes in both pain and addiction treatment, and I appreciate the chance to speak with you all today. Um, it is six o'clock in the morning here in Denver, Colorado, as I record this. Um, so I just want to let you know I appreciate the chance to share this with you all. And uh, um, even though this is not a live event, please feel free to submit any questions you have for me under the video viewer, and they will give me uh, those questions and your contact information, and I'm happy to respond to each and every one of them. So I am speaking today on managing pain in the setting of comorbid substance use disorder, opioid weaning, and MAT initiation. So this is a topic that I could easily spend three to four hours on probably, but I've condensed all of this material into about a 50 minute presentation. Uh, so I will speed through some of it. And again, if you want more information or if you want any of the articles that I reference, feel free to reach out to me or to, to submit that uh, question there uh, online. And I'm happy to, to get back with you about those things. So I practiced, um, primary care medicine in the, in the mountains of Western North Carolina for about 30 years. I actually still see patients there by telemedicine, even though I now live in Colorado. I also do some work with an Alaska Native organization in Juneau, Alaska, seeing uh, patients there treating both pain and addiction. I go up there once a month and then do the rest of my work there by telemedicine. So uh, with today's technology, I'm all over the country. I want to start by saying that I don't have any disclosures. I like to start my talks with this quote that says opioids are the most potent medications we have for the treatment of pain. So this comes from the American Society of Addiction Medicine textbook and uh, chap uh, this chapter 97 is the chapter on treating opioid use disorder and we've all been taught this. And in fact, there is some truth to this, but the problem with this statement and with this understanding of ours is that we confuse potency with efficacy. So clearly opioids are very potent. Right? We have tens of thousands of people dying every year from opioid overdoses. But in reality, they are really not very efficacious in treating pain. So I'll explain all of that as we go through it. And as I do this talk, you'll find that, that in particular, talking about uh, actual treatment of, of, of pain in some of these difficult patients, that'll be the very end of my talk. Before that, I'm gonna be setting up a better understanding of pain and opioids and addiction and how this all fits together. So you'll have a much better uh, understanding on, on the whole uh, situation and how to treat these difficult patients. This graph comes from a report by the CDC in about 2012. And the green line you see there is the increase in opioid prescribing uh, as a result of the marketing of Purdue Pharmaceuticals and, and some of the other um, uh, pharmaceutical agencies uh, that we listen to and we increased our prescribing during this period of time. I was a primary care doctor during, during these years. I listened to the Purdue rep. I began prescribing OxyContin. I prescribed more and more during this same time period, just like the great majority of, of providers throughout the country did. And we saw this pretty linear increase in opioid prescribing year by year. Uh, it started really in the mid to late 1990s and went all the way up until 2012. Well, what this graph shows is, uh, uh, that increase in prescribing is represented by the green line, but parallel to that is an increase in opioid overdose deaths. And when the CDC came out with this report, it's when they first said that the number of opioid overdose deaths we have is directly related to the opioids that we prescribe. And you see the yellow line is increase in treatment admissions for opioid use disorder. Uh, I started treating opioid use disorder in 2004 and uh, have seen that increase personally and have seen many of the people who became addicted because of our prescribing. Now, what we know is, and, and I added to this graph here with my own uh, addition, additional graphics, but we saw that that opioid prescribing increased until about 2012. And since 2012, we've had a decrease in opioid prescribing every year since then. So that's great. But what we know is that we've also seen this increase in opioid overdose deaths that has increased even more since that time. Now, 2017 to 2018, it actually leveled off or dropped a little bit. But 2019, the statistics are going to show it went back up again. In 2020, we think partially because of COVID uh, that opioid overdose deaths will reach their highest rate ever. So we've got a problem. A lot of folks kind of see this graph now and see our opioid prescribing going down. And they'll say, we don't have a problem with opioid prescribing anymore. We have a fentanyl problem. And while that's partially true, many of the over, overdose deaths now are coming from the fentanyl and the heroin, 
these people still start with opioid pills and those opioid pills come from our prescribing. So I contend that by treating pain better and by treating addiction better actually, uh, we can have better outcomes and, and we won't see nearly as many people become addicted to the opioids and then ultimately overdose and die. So this graph comes from a report in the Journal of American Medical Association a few years ago. And this was the state of US health study. And they look at all different diseases. And I pulled out the four that are really related to pain. So that second uh, line graph there is other musculoskeletal disease. But what this shows us is that during that time period from 1990 to 2010, when our opioid prescribing increased actually by about 700%, we actually ended up with more pain in America. So how does that happen? If we're prescribing so many of these opioids, and, and at this point in 2010, we were prescribing enough opioids for every man, woman, and child to have the equivalent of about 120 Vicodin tablets. So if we're prescribing that much, how can we have more pain? Well, some of this is because uh, we're living longer, and some of this is also because our population is aging. But even if we correct for those factors, we still have more pain we still have more disability from pain than we've ever had before. And there's been several other studies that have come out since this time that have con confirmed that, that we have more pain than ever. So I, as I share with you, part of my contention, I think the science shows, is, is that um, our opioid prescribing is not resolving the pain in America, even in our individual patients. And I think many of you have seen this. We start the opioids and people do great at the beginning but as time goes on, their pain gets worse and ultimately they end up with this very severe pain and they're on opioids. And I, I will show you evidence to show that uh, for many of those people, the opioids are actually making their pain worse. So the pharmaceutical industry still has a talking point that says um, we can't reduce our opioid prescribing because we have so many people in America in pain and we need to relieve their pain. Well, in fact, opioids are not relieving their pain. And, and again, as I mentioned, for most of these people, it's making their pain worse. So I think this is happening for three reasons. We, we have this opioid epidemic, this, this horrible epidemic of addiction and overdose death for three reasons. And as a prescriber myself, and I think as prescribers uh, out there listening to this, we need to take some responsibility for that because we did start prescribing a lot more opioids. And even still, we prescribe many more than we did when I first started in practice in 1988. There is some role the public has also because they don't understand this issue either. And, and the fact is altogether, we don't understand pain, we don't understand opioids, and we don't understand addiction. So the studies have shown we get very little training in those areas, even today when this is such a big problem. So I'm gonna talk about all of these things, and then at the end, we're gonna talk about these difficult patients that have a, a, an addiction or maybe uh, you know, have this chronic pain and are not doing well on opioids and what we should do with them and how we should treat them. So I wanna start with talking about pain. So I want to begin by making it very clear that there are two different types of pain. And, and I'm going to say this multiple times during this talk because this is one of the most important things that I'm going to share with you. So we have acute pain and chronic pain. And I was really taught to think of a chronic pain as acute pain that just lasts a long time, right? Well, what we know now and what we've learned really over the past 20 years is that acute pain and chronic pain are very different things. They have the same end result. At the end, they stimulate the somatosensory cortex at the top of our head, uh, at the top of our brain, and they make us hurt. So the pain is the same, the outcome is the same, but the processes are completely different. So with acute pain, usually we can identify the source of the pain. Someone twists their ankle and they have an ankle sprain. We know they have a torn ligament. That tissue damage is sending a signal to the brain and they hurt. As the tissue heals up, their pain gets better. That's acute pain, that's the way pain is supposed to work. The healing almost always occurs within three months, and as the healing occurs, their, their pain goes away and they get better. And, and that's the way we are taught of pain, that's the way we think of pain, and that is actually how, how acute pain works. But chronic pain is very, very different. So for chronic pain, oftentimes it's hard to identify the exact source of the pain. We ask somebody with chronic low back pain where their back hurts, and they, they motion to their entire lower back, their whole lower back hurts, uh, right? We ask somebody with fibromyalgia where they hurt. Well, my whole body hurts. So it's hard to pinpoint that. It's hard to actually see an area of tissue damage. Uh, you know, with chronic low back pain, everybody 
has an abnormal MRI, basically. And that's why um, the American Academy of Family Physicians has said we should not be doing MRIs on people with chronic nonspecific low back pain. Uh, look in the November 1st issue of the American uh, Family Physician. They've got a good article about imaging in chronic pain and how it makes the problem worse in many cases. So chronic pain, it's hard to identify that source, even if we get an MRI. And our treatments oftentimes don't work very well for it. So chronic pain goes on for a while. We're not really sure, sure of the source. We're not really sure how to treat it and people have worse outcomes. The other two things that, that are different about these, uh, these two types of pain is with acute pain, we respond in a way that makes the pain better, right? That's why we have acute pain. It's a warning sign for us so that we pay attention and do what we need to to get better. So it, it's really like a danger signal. And, and we know of, of the diseases where you lose the feeling of pain and how they have worse outcomes. So think of diabetic neuropathy, right? People get a sore in their bottom of their foot. They're not paying attention to it because it doesn't hurt. They get an infection. They end up having complications and sometimes even an amputation. It's the same situation with leprosy. That's why you've seen pictures of people with amputated fingers or hands because they lose the feeling of pain. They don't pay attention to what's going on to their, to their injury uh, and they end up getting infection and losing you know, part of a limb. So acute pain is very helpful for us. And as I said, it goes away when, when the tissue heals up. But chronic pain, we respond to chronic pain in a way that actually makes the pain worse. So, Everybody with chronic pain, regardless of your diagnosis, exercise helps. It helps to be outside. It helps to keep your life active. But everyone responds in a way where they begin to stay inside more. They become less active. They sit in their chair more. They focus more on their pain. And all of this makes chronic pain worse. So chronic pain, we get in this cycle where we respond in a way that makes the pain worse. Because the pain is worse, we respond more in that way by being less active. And ultimately, our pain gets worse. So they're very different things. We now know that chronic pain is often driven by neurologic changes in the central nervous system that magnifies pain and in many cases even creates the pain that we're now feeling. So I'll talk about that a little bit more. But as we think about this, it's very important to understand acute pain is a symptom of something else going on, but chronic pain is a disease of itself and in itself. And so we will treat these very differently. And again, I'm gonna share this multiple times during this talk about the difference as we talk about assessment of pain and as we talk about treatment of pain uh, and, and understanding why some people become addicted. So this definition of pain comes from the International Association for the Study of Pain and they recently just updated it with kind of a minor change. But the important thing to notice is really the first part of this definition and that's where it says that pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So I highlight the emotional part because I wasn't taught about that in medical school or in residency, right? I've been taught of pain as just this sensory experience, but the emotional experience is very, very important. And it's important for two reasons. One, uh, the emotional aspect of pain is what leads to the suffering from pain, which is ultimately what we're trying to treat, right? If somebody has pain, but they can bear it pretty well, uh, that's not nearly as important as someone who maybe has a minor injury and is freaking out and is completely disrupting their life. So this suffering is very important. Uh, we tend to recognize that suffering and we do respond to it, but it's really because of this emotional aspect of pain. What we also know is this emotional aspect of pain will also make the, the sensory aspect worse. So if somebody's really anxious about their pain, if they're really depressed about their pain, uh, if they're scared about their pain, all of that will actually turn up the sensory component so it'll turn their pain, an injury that maybe should have been a three, it'll turn it into a six or even an eight. So the emotional aspect makes the sensory aspect worse. Now what's not mentioned in this definition, but what we also understand is that there's also a cognitive aspect. So what we think about pain also influences how we experience pain and how we feel pain. So we understand this as the placebo effect. If you're having pain, and this will work for acute or chronic pain, if you're having pain, I give you a sugar pill and I tell you this is going to really help your pain. Studies have shown your pain will decrease by about 20% on average. The opposite of that is called the nocebo effect. So if, if I'm about to do a procedure and I tell you, boy, you are going to really hurt tomorrow, then just by hearing that and thinking that it's going to make your pain 20% worse after the uh, procedure. So the nocebo effect is also important. What we think about pain influences how we feel that pain. So as we assess pain 
And as we treat pain, I want us to think of these three areas, the sensory, the cognitive, and the emotional. Now, here's a diagram that I kind of made up, and, I, and obviously this is not so scientific, but more conceptual, where it shows these three aspects of pain and their overlap and how in the center is the patient experience of pain. Now, I want to make it very clear that when we're seeing our patients and we're measuring their pain on a zero to 10 scale, we're just measuring the sensory aspect of their pain. So we're just getting the top part of this whole um, graph I have here. And we're missing this cognitive and emotional aspect, which is also very important. And because of that, we haven't been treating pain very well. So again, as we assess pain, I want us to look at all three of these areas. And as we treat pain, we need to look at this also. So we'll come back to this in a little bit. So as we try to understand pain, this is just a very important concept that our brain changes how we feel the pain. And as I mentioned before, our emotions and our thoughts kind of drive some of that. Well, here's the important thing to understand is that change can, that the brain can, can give to that sensory aspect of pain can be very dramatic. So we've all heard stories and it's been well documented that soldiers in the battlefield can have a bullet wound, say to their shoulder or even to their abdomen and not feel it for hours later until the battle is over, then they realize they've been wounded because their brain has completely turned off that pain signal. On the other hand, we know there's some cases where the brain even creates the pain signal to cause people to hurt when in fact there's nothing wrong with the tissues where they are hurting. And we'll talk about this in a minute. So this is a very important concept. Again, we weren't taught that. We were taught that, you know, that really the degree of injury kind of relates to the amount of pain they have. That's not true. So this graph kind of shows how the pain system works. So this guy stubs his toe, the inflammation or tissue damage actually activates the nociceptor nerve fibers. They start that signal cascade. So you see it travels along that fiber. You see in circle two where it goes into the dorsal ganglion and, and the dorsal horn of the, of the spinal cord. It stops there and connects to the second nerve in the process, the spinothalamic nerve. That nerve crosses to the other side of the spinal cord and goes all the way up to the base of the brain. You see that in circle four where it ends in the thalamus. Now in the thalamus, it connects to the somatosensory cortex. And again, as I mentioned before, when that area of the brain is activated, that's when we feel pain. If we block that signal, say with an epidural uh, anesthesia, and, and the signal doesn't get to the brain, people don't hurt. So it's the activation of this area in the brain that, that makes people feel pain. But you'll notice in circle four that the, brain is, that the thalamus is sending signals to other parts of the brain also. So this is these other areas of the brain uh, make an interpretation of the risk of that pain. And then they send a signal back that either that modifies that final signal to the somatocentric cortex, either turning the volume up so we feel more pain, so we respond to it, or turning it down so that we feel less pain and we don't respond so much to it. We've all experienced this, playing ball with your family or friends. You're having a great time. You stub your toe, right? You just, you barely feel it. You maybe notice it right on, right away, but then you go on, you're playing, you have a great time. After the game, your toe really starts to hurt because now you're focusing more on it and you're not having as much fun as you were before. So our brain does this. So I, I like to show this uh, series of, of, of slides so you can see how our brain does change our sensory input. It does it for all sensory input, right? It does it for hearing, it does it for vision. Um, that's why you can be in a crowded room and people talking all around you, but you can pay attention and hear the person in front of you and your brain kind of blocks out some of that other noise. This is how it does it for our vision. So you look at this, at this picture, and I will tell you that square A and square B are the exact same shade of gray. But as you look at that, you can't make these look the same because your brain is changing that final signal to your occipital cortex. And so you perceive B as a lighter square because that's what makes sense. Your brain says B should be a white square, A should be a dark square. But as we take away some of the surrounding picture, you'll see that A and B get closer and closer in, in, this, uh, in, in their shading so that they look more and more alike until finally at the end you see they are the same color. And this is actually cut out from the first picture I showed you because the first time I saw this, I thought, no, nah, no, nah, they're changing that as we go along. But no, in, in reality, they are the same. But your brain changed that, that sensory input. So it does it for pain as well. So I'm gonna show this multiple times also, this little graphic, because I think this is also very important as we understand pain and as we think about our patients with pain. So for acute pain, most of that pain comes from the tissue input. But as I mentioned before, our thoughts and our emotions modify it. They make it e either hurt more or hurt less so that we respond to it in an appropriate way. So again, that's the way pain is supposed to work. But in chronic pain, 
our thoughts and our emotions are the major drivers of the pain and tissue input has a much lower, less of a factor. In fact, many people with chronic pain have no tissue input and their central nervous system is, is, is um, causing all of these signals to go to their somatosensory cortex. So the final activation is in their somatosensory cortex. So they really do hurt. They have very real pain, but it may not be coming from the area they're hurting. So fibromyalgia is the classic. There's no activation of the nociceptor nerves in fibromyalgia, right? This all happens within the central nervous system, this activation of this pain signal that makes them hurt. Many people with chronic low back pain, it might've started with an acute injury, but after it goes on for a while and becomes a chronic pain, now their central nervous system is, is driving the pain and it may be magnifying from, uh, a signal from arthritis in their back so that they hurt really bad or in many cases, it may be creating the signal itself. So they feel the pain in their back, but the problem is not in their back any longer. So we'll come back to that again several times. So as we think about pain, think there's two types. There's acute and chronic. They're very, very different. They're, other than the final activation of the somatosensory cortex, they're different processes. As we look at what causes pain, there's really four causes. And, and these can play, be a factor in both acute and chronic pain in different degrees. So nociceptive pain is the pain the way we understand it, right? You stub your toe, sends a signal to your brain, it hurts. That makes sense to us, we understand that. Neuropathic pain is when there's damage to the, that nerve transmission system and the, the pain fibers are firing when they shouldn't. That causes pain when we shouldn't have pain. We understand that as well. The third type of pain is called nociplastic pain, and this is a relatively new term, so you may not have heard about it, but noci means pain, plastic means change. And basically, this comes from changes in the central nervous system that are causing you to either feel more pain or even, again, creating pain. So central, sensitiz central sensitization is the classic example of this. Most people with chronic pain have some element of central sensitization magnifying their pain. In many cases, the central sensitization is causing their pain as well. So that's nociplastic pain. The central nervous system has changed. It may have changed because of ongoing pain, but there's some other things that can cause those changes as well. But the end result is still pain. And finally, opioid withdrawal. So I add this in here. This might actually be a type of nociplastic pain where the central nervous system has changed in response to the opioids we're prescribing or that they are taking, but it's different enough. I like to kind of highlight this as well. About 6% of the adult population takes opioids on a daily basis, most of them from prescriptions we give them. When they try to cut back on their dose, or if they take too many during the month and start to run out at the end of the month and have to cut back on their dose, it's gonna make their pain worse. So if they're taking it for low back pain, their low back is gonna hurt more. So they interpret this to mean that their back is worse than it's ever been, when in fact it's a physiologic response to the withdrawal of their, pain, of their opioids. So we need to understand this as we're talking to people about weaning, their pain will get worse as we try to taper them off of the opioids, but after they get off, their pain gets better, right? So it's, a, it's something they need to understand as they're trying to come off their opioids. This is just another diagram. I like this because it really shows also how our emotions and our thoughts are affecting pain. It can have a positive or negative effect on pain, but notice that pain always has a negative uh, impact on our thoughts and our emotions. So this kind of shows, first of all, that it's very important that we treat acute pain uh, effectively and quickly, because the longer it goes on, the more likely they are to, to develop chronic pain. But also for individuals that start with anxiety or depression or a difficult social situation, that's gonna make their acute pain worse and it's gonna make it last longer and makes them more likely to, to develop chronic pain. So in fact, the, the risk of developing chronic pain after a surgical procedure or after an injury is, is mostly affected by their mental status at the time of the injury, whether they have depression or anxiety. The next most important factor is, is their social situation. Do they live in a home where there's abuse? Do they hate their job? That also develop, uh, drives the development of chronic pain. The severity of the injury or the surgery is the least important factor. So these are some common central sensitization syndromes. As you look at these, those of us in primary care will realize these are some of our most difficult patients. Uh, and again, part of that has been because we haven't really understood the problem. This is being driven by their central nervous system. And, and for the chronic low back pain, we can treat their back and give them surgery, do procedures. They will help temporarily, but they don't help permanently because that initial probably placebo effect has some benefits, but as that wears off, their pain comes back. So that's pain, that just, again, very brief, 
primer on, on how pain is a little different from maybe what most of us learned, how central sensitization is a major factor in many people with chronic pain and how we need to be addressing that and treating that as we treat their chronic pain or our outcomes will be worse. So let's talk a little bit about opioids. So opioids are addicting because they stimulate dopamine release in the reward center of the brain, right? All addicting substances do that. All addicting behaviors do that. So dopamine secretion in our brain is meant to help us continue the human race, right? So dopamine is secreted when we eat a good meal. That helps us keep eating so that we live longer. Uh, dopamine is secreted when we have sex, so that we want to have sex and, and keep uh, the human race going. Uh, gambling. It's secreted if you win the big prize because winning secretes dopamine, which makes you want to win and be more successful. So dopamine is an important chemical in our brain and our reward center, but all the addicting substances cause that to be secreted unnaturally. And opioids are one that, that does that. So I've been treating addiction a long time. I've been treating opioid use disorder a long time, and it didn't take me long to figure out that opioids are different from all, uh, all other addicting substances. People get addicted to them faster and they have a harder time coming off of them. And why is that? And it's because opioids are different from all other addicting substances. So they do stimulate dopamine secretion. You feel good when you take them. That's what makes them addicting. But they also activate the opioid receptor. And the opioid receptor is very important for us to understand as we're treating both pain and addiction. So as I learned this, 15 years ago, I'm thinking, what is the purpose of our opioid receptors? Why do we have those? And as we all know, opioid receptors are supposed to be stimulated by our own endorphins. But what's the purpose of the endorphins? Why do we have those? So studies have shown that, that we have endorphins and opioid receptors to help us achieve a short-term goal. So stimulation of endorphins in our brain does several things. And think of the long distance runner who's been running a long distance and they're at mile 24 of their marathon and they're hurting, they're tired, they're about to give up and suddenly they get this endorphin surge, right? So they do decrease pain because if you're hurting, you're more likely to give up. They increase your motivation to keep doing whatever you're doing. They increase your confidence that you can achieve whatever you're trying to do. They increase reward so they stimulate dopamine secretion to make you feel good about what you're doing, which by the way is why some people get addicted to exercise. They reduce depression and anxiety. I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. This is very important because if you're depressed or you're anxious, you're more likely to give up what you're doing. So they take away that depression and anxiety. And finally, they increase something the scientists call warmth liking. And that's actually liking warm things. It's when you've been outside in a cold day and you come inside and you get next to the fire and have a hot cup of co coffee or cocoa, or you take a hot shower or you get underneath the electric blanket on a cold night, that warm, comfortable feeling are your endorphins activating your opioid receptors. The scientists use the same term for interpersonal bonding, the love between a mother and a child, the love or, or companionship between coworkers working together on a project. This warm, comfortable feeling you have with your friends and your colleagues, that is also your endorphins doing that. And so that's very, very important, again, for us to work with others and to be successful. So I call this system our success system. It's very, very important to help us be successful in whatever we're doing. So it's important to understand this because as we give people opioids, for some people, it'll really activate this system and they feel great. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the longer they take it, the more it damages this system and to where they're depending on their opioids to give them any of these feelings. But when we try to stop them or cut them back, they have the opposite of all of this, right? They have more pain, less motivation, less confidence. Uh, they don't feel good about anything. They have more depression and anxiety. And all of this makes it very, very hard to stop these medications, whether they're prescribed or whether they're addicted to them and they're buying them on the streets. So you all remember the story of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, right? Dorothy and her friends have been in the woods and all these bad things are happening to them. The woods is this dark, scary place and they just want to get out and get to Oz, right? Dorothy's lonely. She's missing her family. She wants to get back to those people she loves. And suddenly they come out of the woods to this field of poppies planted by the wicked witch of the east of the west i'm sorry and so you as we know poppies are full of opium and you remember their initial reaction right right away they straighten up they have this new motivation this confidence this happiness from the dopamine that's now surging all because of the opium they have a feeling of interpersonal bonding so they link arms and they go skipping and dancing down the yellow brick road so i call that the dorothy reaction because many of my patients describe a very similar experience. They'll say, you know, I grew up in a household where our father was abusive. He beat us all. I, I would watch him beat my sister. He beat my mom. He beat me. Home was this scary place. 
but school was not an escape for me. I didn't like going to school either because I struggled in school. I got in trouble in school. So 10th grade, I drop out of school. In a couple of years, I'm pregnant. I had my first child. A couple of years later, I had my second child. Now I'm a single parent. I can only get a minimum wage job at a convenience store because I don't have a high school education. I hate my boss. I hate my job. The kids are difficult. I can't pay my bills. Life is very, very hard. Sprained my ankle. Doc gave me Percocet. I took that first one. I thought, wow, I can do this. I had this feeling of confidence, motivation, happiness I had never felt in my entire life. And people that have that response are very likely to end up getting addicted to these medications because, I mean, that's what we live for is that dopamine surge, right? And this is the only thing that gives them to us, gives it to them. So an important, uh, I think this is a great way to understand really what opioids do to many people. So as I mentioned, I call that the Dorothy reaction. I think that's a side effect because people that have that, again, have this real motivation to keep taking them and end up getting addicted. But opioids have other problems too. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but they are mentally impairing. People taking opioids even on a daily basis of a, of a single dose, uh, they are still impaired to the point where they, it is dangerous for them to be driving and they should not be driving their vehicle. They should not be working in safety sensitive positions. They delay recovery from surgery or from injuries. They increase medical costs for a number of reasons. They lead to opioid hyperalgesia. So if, if I have a wrist sprain and I take ibuprofen, it's working right there in my wrist, right? To decrease the inflammation and decrease the pain. But if I take an opioid, it's working in my brain. My brain realizes that's happening and it tries to respond to it to overcome that. Thinking, no, you should be feeling that, that pain. That pain is important for you. So immediately it begins to make changes and the opioid receptors start to go underneath the cell surface so they cannot be activated. You make less endorphins, you have changes in other neurotransmitters and even neural pathways to, to overcome that opioid so that then when you stop it, you feel more pain. And for acute pain, normally that's not an issue. It can be sometimes, but normally it's not so much of an issue, but for chronic pain, it always is. Uh, because people, their, their, their pain amount doesn't get better with acute pain as they're healing, hopefully their pain is improving. But with chronic pain, that doesn't happen. When they try to stop it, it becomes harder to stop. This study showed that uh, if you give opioids after an injury for uh, a seven day prescription or more within the first um, couple of months of the injury, it doubles their risk of being disabled one year later. This study showed it increased the risk of falls and fractures in the elderly by a factor of four. This study showed that the cardiac risk from opioids is similar to many of the non-selective, or many of the non-selective uh, um, NSAIDs, even worse than those, and even worse than it was for Bextra or, or um, um, Vioxx, which were taken off the market because of those. This study showed that the risk of GI bleeding is similar with those on opioids as it, as it is to those that are on um, non-selective um, uh, NSAIDs. So. If somebody has a history of an ulcer disease, opioids are not the wise choice to avoid NSAIDs, right? We need to think of something else for their pain treatment. I wanna focus a little bit on these two. I mentioned this before. Activation of the opioid receptor is very calming. So people calm down, it reduces anxiety for people with anxiety disorders. That's really very important to them. It works better than the benzodiazepines, but the effect is temporary. And as it wears off, their anxiety becomes worse. And so when used long-term, anxiety always gets worse. Same thing with depression. People with chronic depression, they'll tell you, you know, I've been on Paxil and Prozac and, and all these other antidepressants. They all work a little bit, but the opioids, first time I took one within 10 minutes, my depression went away completely. So it's really miraculous to people with chronic depression. But as they develop that tolerance, as their brain begins to change to respond to that, their depression gets worse to where after they've been on them for a month, their depression is worse while taking opioids than it was before they even stopped and when they, or before they even started. And when they do stop taking the opioids, their depression gets worse yet. As we know, there's issues with diversion, uh, overdose issues. Uh, this study showed that, that taking opioids for one month caused changes in the brain that can be measured on an MRI. Uh, you stop the opioids, six months later, recheck the MRI, the changes are still there. So we think those changes are permanent. And as we know, they can lead to addiction. So as we understand some of what opioids do to us, we understand why they can be a problem in those with central sensitization. So in individuals with acute, with chronic pain, where their thoughts and their emotions are driving most of their pain, 
and it's their depression and their anxiety that's causing a lot of that ongoing pain. We give them an opioid for their chronic pain and that gets better dramatically and their pain is dramatically better and they feel better than they have in years and years and they love us as providers, right? But as their brain begins to make the changes and, and adapt to that, their pain gets worse until ultimately after being on them for a month or two, their depression is worse, their anxiety is worse, and now their pain is worse than it's ever been before. But when we try to stop it, again, that is all magnified and it gets even worse. So we get in this trap with these folks on chronic opioids where it becomes very hard to get them off. So how should we treat pain? So I'm going to start again by remembering this, this graphic. As we use medications, in particular the NSAIDs and acetaminophen, they work mostly on this tissue aspect of, of pain. So they work better for acute pain, but they don't work very well for chronic pain, right? So for chronic pain, we need to be addressing the thoughts and the emotions more. So th these are Cochrane reviews that looked at treating acute pain. This is post-operative pain and their goal, their measurement is 50% pain relief. If, if somebody's having pain in the post-op unit, and they say their pain is an eight, and you give them the medication, it goes down to a four, that's successful treatment. People are happy with 50% pain reduction. 30% pain reduction, they recognize that they're better, but they're not happy with it. So our goal is to reduce pain by 50%. Again, this is acute pain. These people are, have just had surgery and are in the post-op unit, and they found that 200 milligrams of ibuprofen, one over-the-counter ibuprofen, and 37% of people said their pain is reduced by 50% or more. 500 milligrams of acetaminophen, 28% of people said that. You double the dose of ibuprofen to 400, it only goes up to 40%. You go up to 600 milligrams, it only goes up to 42% of people. So higher doses of ibuprofen are not much better for acute pain. Now they might be necessary for inflammation, but for acute pain, there's, there's not a big difference for that. And the lower dose, the 200 milligram dose is very, very safe. 15 milligrams of oxycodone is less effective than one extra strength Tylenol. The pharmaceutical companies know this. That's why they combine oxycodone with acetaminophen. This is actually two Percocet tablets with a little extra acetaminophen, and the results are no different from one over-the-counter ibuprofen. About 37% of people have their pain reduced by 50%. Now, they might be calmer, so if they have a lot of anxiety issues that you might notice more improvement overall, but the more anxiety or the more depression they have, the more likely they are to develop this long-term addiction, so we need to be careful with that. What they do in Europe, what we're just starting to do here is combine ibuprofen with acetaminophen, 200 milligrams, one over-the-counter ibuprofen, one extra strength Tylenol taken at the same time. You take these together, 62% of people have adequate pain relief. I urge you to try this yourself. Try it in your patients. It can be done in, in you know, post-op unit. In particular, my contention is for outpatient treatment of pain, this is the most effective thing and we should be using this. Unless there's a contraindication for some reason, this should be our primary treatment for outpatient treatment of pain. Don't think medications are the only thing that works for acute pain. So if they're in the hospital, we might want to be thinking of other things if they keep having pain. Uh, IM or IV Ketorolac can be very helpful. Distraction of any kind can be helpful. So if you have a patient that's had surgery, the last thing you want them to do is lying in a bed just thinking about how much they hurt, right? You want to distract them as much as possible. That might mean visitors. Uh, even during COVID, we might want to figure out how to do that in a safe way. Virtual reality, regional blocks, nitrous oxide, the dentists use this a lot. We don't use it nearly as much as we should in, in, in uh, medicine. Very effective at reducing pain, very safe. Low-dose ketamine also, probably more effective than morphine is in reducing pain and safer. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness, pre-op education, all these things can be done as well. So we need to be looking at the whole person, looking at our entire arm and armamentarium as we're talking about treating acute pain effectively to try to avoid that use of opioids. Chronic pain, again, here's that, that picture again. Chronic pain is different for acute pain. Obviously, we need to be addressing their thoughts and our emotions. So behavioral therapy becomes the cornerstone of treatment for chronic pain. And if you're seeing chronic pain patients and they're wanting medications from you and they're not seeing a behavioral therapist, they're not getting adequate care, right? It needs to also be a behavioral therapist who knows how to do CBT for pain, cognitive behavioral therapy for pain. That helps them identify their negative pain thoughts and change those thoughts. Right? That's why it's cognitive behavioral therapy. They change how they think about things. They have a more positive, optimistic outlook. They have less anxiety. They have less depression. They have less negative response to their pain and their pain gets better, but actually their entire lives get better. So behavioral therapy needs to be the cornerstone. PT and OT is also important. It helps take away some of those pain memories. Again, people with chronic low back pain, the problem's not in their back so much anymore. So they need to learn how to do those movements again. 
And a lot of PT and OTs now are also learning some of these CBT techniques and, and doing behavioral therapy while they're doing their treatment uh, and having better success. So these other things are important as well. I do mention the medications, but I mentioned them near the bottom of the list. The best studies for any medication show 20 to 30% pain reduction. As I mentioned before, for chronic pain, 20 to 30% is enough that they barely notice the improvement, but they're not happy with it. So the answer is not medications. They might be part of a multimodal or multidisciplinary treatment program, but they're just a part. We need to be doing all of these other things. Some procedures may reduce pain 30%. Some of that might just be temporary, whether it's an epidural steroid injection, uh, radiofrequency nerve ablation in the back, uh, spinal cord stimulators are a little longer lasting for some people with chronic back pain and may be more effective. But again, we need to be focusing on the top of this list and doing more behavioral therapy. So what about our patients? These are our difficult patients, the ones that are already on opioids. They're still having chronic pain. They're not functionally improved. They're staying at home all the time. They're wanting more pain relief. They're depressed. They're anxious. These are our difficult patients. What do we do with them? So if they're, if they're on opioids and they're doing much better and now they're much more active and they're functionally much better, document that improvement in pain and function. The CDC has some, some tools you can use, in particular the PEG tool, Pain Enjoyment of Life and General Activity, that you can use to measure this improvement. And if that's the case, carefully continue the, the, the opioids. I will contend that that is not the case in the majority of our chronic opioid patients. So what do you do with them? Weaning off opioids is the appropriate thing. Now that's not always easy to do, so sometimes we just wean them to a lower, safer dosage, maybe try to get them down to 40 morphine milligram equivalents a day instead of 200. Uh, so at that, in that situation, they're safer. I think this is seldom the appropriate answer. Sometimes we need to change the opioid to buprenorphine, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Buprenorphine is different from other opioids. It is better for chronic pain than any of the other opioids that we have. So if you're going to make a change, it's important first to kind of identify where the patient is. It makes your job a whole lot easier. So if they're pre-contemplative, if they're not even thinking about stopping their opioids, it's going to be hard to convince them they should do that. And sometimes we just need to tell them we're going to do that. It can't be their choice because the opioids have changed their brain and they're in a dangerous place now that's going to get worse. But if they're pre-contemplative, we need to understand that. If they're contemplative, if they're thinking about it and maybe open to what you're saying, it becomes much easier. So several studies have looked at tapering people on chronic opioid therapy and has shown that while they taper down, as I mentioned before, their pain will get worse. That opioid withdrawal pain will make their pain worse. So they need to know that. But once they get off of it, their pain gets better than it was before. So about 20 to 25% better. So again, enough they notice it's a little better. It's not a miracle, but now at least they're not on the opioids anymore. One study showed it also reduced their depression and pain catastrophizing. Again, because they're not affecting their brain quite so much. But as we know, it's really, really hard to taper people all the way off of opioids. How do you do that taper? So I'm just going to reference this. This is from the uh, United States Health and Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, it's online. It's a great kind of taper kit that tells you how to do it. And I, you know, to really summarize, I will summarize by saying take as long as you need to. It might take a year or two or three to get them off their opioids if they're on high dose opioids. If you do it too fast, they're gonna have withdrawal symptoms, they're gonna get sick, they might start buying them on the street, they might just leave your practice, you don't want that to happen. So look this up and follow some of their guidelines, it's really very good. So a lot of experts now say about a five to 10% reduction from the original dose per month. At the end, you might need to slow down a little bit. Um, it's, as I mentioned, though, it's very hard. If the person is motivated to come off of it, they'll be much more likely to be successful. Many times you can get to a certain point and not beyond that. Um, but just don't go too fast. You go too fast, you're gonna have bad outcomes. So here's a, a case example. Steven's a 55-year-old male. He's on chronic opioid therapy for, for chronic low back pain. He's on a t total daily dose of 180 milligrams of, mo of oxycodone. So that's the equivalent of 240 uh, morphine milligram equivalents per day. That's a big, big dose. You start to taper them down. You, you do a very slow taper, but even after the first dose reduction, you check a urine drug screen, and now he's also positive for opiates, right? Uh, he's also positive for methamphetamine and amphetamine. So he's taking meth, he's buying it on the street somewhere, and he's also getting another opiate or opioid that he's taking along with the oxycodone, because the oxycodone generally does not turn the opiate test positive. So he started buying drugs in the street. Not an uncommon scenario. 
So consider changing him to buprenorphine for both pain and addiction. The addiction was likely caused by the opioids we've been giving him, but it just hasn't been apparent until we tried to reduce the dose. So he has both pain and he has addiction. Buprenorphine is the medication for that. So why do we pick buprenorphine? There, it has several special characteristics that no other opioids have. It is really very unique. I think in many people, it's like a miracle almost. So it's a partial agonist. So it's much safer than all other opioids, meaning they take more than about uh, 24 to 32 milligrams and the extra doses don't do anything. In particular, they don't cause respiratory depression, right? So you can take a whole bottle and you're not gonna die from an overdose. However, we think that that's not the case for pain relief. We think that you don't reach that ceiling effect for pain relief, so higher doses might be more effective for that. When changed from opioids to buprenorphine, say this guy was on 180 milligrams of, of oxycodone, you switch him to buprenorphine, on average, his pain will reduce about, about 50%. So they have significant improvement in their pain. And again, 50%, they're happy with that. They're happy with that pain reduction. Uh, the other thing with buprenorphine is you don't develop tolerance to it. So we can find a dose that works and you can stay on that the rest of their lives. Uh, that's actually the, the same situation with methadone. Both methadone and buprenorphine are the only two opioids where you don't develop tolerance, which is also why we use them to treat opioid use disorder. And if they do decide to wean off later, or you decide it, it is easier to wean off buprenorphine than other opioids. Now it's not easy, it's still difficult, but it's easier than it would be with the oxycodone. Here's a very important thing, it treats depression. So again, many of these people from their chronic pain have depression, but also from the opioids we give them. Buprenorphine works differently. It actually blocks the kappa opioid receptor, which is responsible for causing depression, while other opioids activate that receptor and cause depression. Uh, buprenorphine blocks the kappa opioid receptor, and so it actually treats depression. So these people become happier as well. Plus, it's pretty potent. So eight milligrams of buprenorphine is about the equivalent of 240 milligrams of morphine orally. Um, so it's a pretty decent pain medication as well. So if you change to buprenorphine, what do you use? So the butrans patch or the buprenorphine patch, uh, you know, comes in different strengths, but that probably results in the lowest plasma levels of buprenorphine. The Belbuca, the buccal formulation, which also has a pain indication that goes, in, it goes on the inside of your cheek, it gets higher plasma uh, levels. But to get the highest levels, you need to do the sublingual formulation that we use for addiction. And you should use the combination pill, the buprenorphine with the naloxone. Naloxone is not absorbed when they take it under the tongue or even when they swallow it. Uh, uh, but that, when you take that, it reaches much higher plasma levels. So in the case of, of Stephen, the case earlier, who was on a pretty high dose of oxycodone, he probably won't do well with the patch or with the buccal formulation. He needs the sublingual formulation we use for, for treatment of opioid use disorder. You don't need an X waiver to use it for pain. You just write in the prescription that they're taking it for pain and they can use your regular DEA number. How do you make that change? Well, again, for Stephen on the opioids, you would ask him to stop his oxycodone for at least 24 hours. He should be in significant withdrawal. And then he starts the buprenorphine. Uh, and you know, you kind of taper the dose over the next few days and find what works for them. Very commonly, it's gonna be 16 to 24 milligrams a day, um, but you find what works. Again, you can't overdose, so it's very safe making this change. And again, people feel a lot better. It can be done at home. They don't have, you don't have to do it in your office or in the hospital. If they have a hard time stopping and going through withdrawals, there's something called microdosing, and I've got a lot more information on this. Feel free to contact me, I'll send you more information. But you gradually increase the dose of buprenorphine. They continue on their opioid, and you start with half a milligram of buprenorphine the first day, and then a half twice a day the next day, and you gradually increase that, that dose, and it begins to replace their opioid on their opioid receptors in a gradual way. And then on day seven, they can just stop their opioid. They'll be on buprenorphine, and they won't have any withdrawal symptoms the whole time. This is really, very cool for a lot of people. For people on methadone, uh, this makes this transition really, really easy. So it, I encourage you to think about that again. I've got a lot of articles on that. That is really considered, uh, for if you're gonna use any opioid for the treatment of chronic pain, it should be buprenorphine. If you're starting a new opioid, if you have a patient and you're thinking about starting an opioid, again, I'd be very cautious with that because we don't have evidence that the long-term uh, uh, pain relieving effects continue. But if they do, they probably do with buprenorphine. So I would start with the buprenorphine transdermal system. If you're gonna start somebody on an opioid, maybe go to the buccal formulation later on. If that doesn't work, then you wean them off. You don't switch them to oxycodone or morphine. So 
say going back to Stephen, we've tried to wean him off. He didn't do well. He started taking other drugs. Now, really, because of some of the behaviors he's having, he probably does qualify for the dose for the diagnosis of opioid use disorder. Uh, it's probably been the the the. This illness happened, this addiction illness happened because of our prescribing, uh, but it doesn't mean we ignore it or, or don't treat it. So people often need treatment, often they need medications for this. These are really the four current treatments for opioid use disorder. Uh, detox and abstinence is historically what we have used. Uh, people go into a detox unit, it takes about seven days. Detox is horrible. You know, not only do they have the severe pain, but the anxiety and the depression that develops can be life-threatening. Right? If you're doing this on an outpatient, they could you know, really commit suicide, so it can be very dangerous. It's very difficult. After they've gone through the acute detox, there's something called chronic um, opioid withdrawal, and that's this ongoing depression and anxiety because they've caused damage to their endorphins and their opioid receptor system. So a lot of folks that go through detox and abstinence, most people have this chronic ongoing uh, anxiety, depression, and craving. and the great majority of times they'll relapse. 90% of people relapse within six months. Methadone has been out since the 1960s, very effective in treating opioid use disorder. It replaces the endorphins that are missing and activates the few opioid receptors that are left. So people feel normal when they take methadone. As I mentioned before, you don't develop tolerance to it. It also has a very slow onset of action, so you don't feel high from it. So very, very good, but methadone is very dangerous. Very easy to overdose on methadone if you take too much. There are a lot of dr drug interactions with methadone that can be life-threatening or even life-ending. So methadone is very dangerous for treatment of opioid use disorder. It can only be prescribed in an outpatient treatment program or a methadone program. So it is very good. I don't think methadone should ever be used for pain. It is way too dangerous. Uh, but in a methadone program, it saves lives. And, and I'm a director of a methadone program in North Carolina, and I will tell you, uh, it saves lives, it brings people back to normal again. They have kind of a bad reputation for several reasons, uh, but they do work. Buprenorphine or, or Suboxone, as you know, can be prescribed in a doctor's office. It's much, much safer because you can't overdose and because it does not have those drug interactions. It's almost as effective as methadone. If you're not prescribing buprenorphine for opioid use disorder, I encourage you to take the training and get your X waiver and start doing it. It changed my life doing that. So I just saw people go from the worst point in their life, from their horrible addiction, to getting their life completely back to normal. Uh, it has more response. I mean, it, it has more effects and positive response than any other medication we use for diabetes or hypertension or anything. It is really, really cool. Uh, it actually becomes fun to work with people with addiction uh, and bring them back to normal and make them feel normal again. So it's really cool. Think about that again. I'm happy to talk with anybody if you're considering it. Very easy to do. Um, now, Trexone injection is Vivitrol. It is the opioid receptor blocker. Uh, it comes in pill form, but the pill, pill form does not work for opioid use disorder. You have to do the long-term injection. This is still only available name brand. It costs $1,000 a month or so. It is just not very effective. And why? Because it's blocking that opioid receptor, right? That receptor is already damaged. We already are missing endorphins already. These people on Vivitrol have a hard time being motivated. They have a hard time feeling confident. They have a hard time feeling fun. They have a hard time feeling connected to family and friends. So now Trexone has a very high uh, failure rate. So as you look at the real world studies, and you see at the bottom of the slide, this is my interpretation from multiple studies. Again, I'm, I'm happy to share those with you. But methadone is probably the most successful. Buprenorphine is pretty close, I think, because it's much safer and easier. People should be started on buprenorphine first. And if they are unsuccessful, then switch to methadone. Detox and abstinence, the success rate is horrible. And in fact, studies have shown that if an individual goes into an inpatient detox and abstinence-based program, a 28-day inpatient program, they are at three times higher risk of dying when they come out than if they never got treatment at all. So very unsuccessful people often overdose and die. Uh, many experts, including myself, think this should not even be offered for most people. And very highly motivated, uh, highly successful people with a lot of support systems think people in the medical profession, it may be uh, worth trying. But even most people in the medical profession, most doctors and nurses, they still need buprenorphine or methadone. That's my contact information. I've rushed through a lot of stuff. Again, I could talk on any one of these subjects for an hour or two and give you a lot more information. Um, 
You know, I think in summary, um, we need to understand pain better. Chronic pain is different from acute pain. We need to address, in the, behavior, address the behavioral aspects of it. Um, we should be very hesitant to start any opioid for chronic pain. If we do start one, it should be buprenorphine. If people are already on opioids, we need to think about changing to buprenorphine. And if people have addiction, we need to think about putting them on buprenorphine as well. So again, my contact information there, you can also put questions underneath uh, the video uh, on your monitor now, uh, and they will get that to me along with your contact information and I will answer everything. So I appreciate the chance to share with you. I hope you all have had a great conference and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.